a Living History production. I'm Matt McLaughlin. And I'm Pete Smith. We're battlefield historians who love nothing better than getting out and walking the ground where great battles in history took place. And now we'd like you to come with us. Every week, Battle Walks will take you to one of the great battlefields of Europe. As we walk the ground, we'll dig through the pages of history, we'll uncover the secrets of the battlefields, and most importantly, we'll tell the stories of the people who fought and died there. Welcome to Battle Walks. Hello and welcome to Battle Walks. Thank you for joining us once again for a stroll across the great battlefields of Europe. It's been fantastic. Thank you for joining us because we've loved doing it. We've seen the the download numbers double in recent weeks. So it's just fantastic the number of people that are getting on board. I think when we started doing this, there was a fair uh, a fair requirement for to give us something to do to fill the time in during COVID. But it's great that so many people have come on board. And so Battle Walks is uh, certainly going to continue long into the future. I should introduce, obviously, like always, my colleague who will be joining me on these walks across the battlefields. It's Pete Smith. Pete, great to have you back again. Yeah, hi, Mark. Nice to be with you again. Mate, this one we're doing this week, pretty close to our hearts, I think. Uh, Hill 60 in Belgium, in the Ypres salient. And, I mean, this is just one of the essential sites. It seems that I say this every time we talk about the Western Front, that it's an essential site. It's a reflection of the the range of important sites that are there on the battlefield. But there's a few sites you go to that just really connect you with the history, that bring the story alive, that are just absolutely iconic. And Hill 60 certainly has to be at the top of that list. Uh, for me, it's uh, it's a must uh, a must go to site. And very oddly, I haven't been to it for over a year because of COVID. I can't travel across the border into Belgium and uh, and and go and have a look around the site. So, oh, thirty years I've been there multiple times every year, and for over a year and not been there. So I'm I'm missing it greatly. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a fantastic fight, uh, site. And anybody that uh, is going to explore the battlefields, especially the battlefields around Ypres and Belgium, then you've got to go. It's not a particularly big site, but it's very big in terms of the history of what went on there and also the history after the war because this was a site that was preserved from the mo- pretty much the moment the guns fell silent. It, there's just some wonderful, sto- not wonderful, just some emotive and terrifying in many cases stories about what went on from both sides, the scene of mining, you know, terrible trench fighting, just uh, so much went on in such a compact area. I mean, there is the horror that, that that's obviously this connected with the Great War in in, in all of it, all of its uh, forms. But I think I think there there is something to take from it, and and that's partly due to to us, to the people that go and visit it, and the stories associated with the visitors. And of course, people have been visiting the site since the 1920s, and that will be part of this story, is that it has been a site that was preserved very early, and so the, really the first visitors were the relatives of those killed in the area and the men themselves returning. So it's, it's a very important site for them and for uh, the overall history of the Great War and onwards to modern times. Well, let's um, put it in context. Tell us where exactly Hill 60 is, why it's called Hill 60, and why it was important to the history of the Great War. Well, I've just mentioned the town itself. Uh, back to that that difficulty, wipers, eep, um, other variations of it. Uh, it's uh, just on on the ridges, just outside of the town. So it's it's part of the fighting that started right at the beginning of the war, as the British troops become involved. And at this stage, it is just British troops trying to keep the Germans away from the town of Eep and fighting on those ridges around the outsides of the town. So it is it is on the ridges. It's actually I have to just think a direction. It's uh, to the slightly um, east, so it's southeast, southeast of of the town. If you're looking at a at a map, um, and um, a very important and key point, as will become obvious as we start talking. And why do we call it Hill Sixty? Ah, good point. Um, four years in my early formative years, as I'm starting to study the Great War, I was aware of Hill Sixty. I was aware of Hill Sixty Three. I was aware of Hill Sixty Two. All roughly in the same area, so it just stood to reason that there was a Hill One somewhere. And by the time we got to this point, we were up to uh, to Hill Sixty, and of course, that's not the case at all. It is in fact height. Um, and in this case, it's rather odd because it's metres above sea level, so it's 60 metres above sea level. Now, why I stress that point is because we are in imperial at this period. Um, 
that our measurements is not uh, metric, it's imperial, so why isn't it 60 feet? Because it certainly was, if we leap across to the Gallipoli Peninsula, there is a hill 60 on the Gallipoli Peninsula, and that is 60 feet above uh, sea level. So why are we in metres? Well, it's as simple as this. The maps and everything that we are going to inherit from the French and the Belgians and use for our calculations were all in metres, and it felt easier just to leave them in metres. So we actually use metres uh, for heights during the First World War. So 60 60 metres high, Hill 60. And I don't think we can stress enough that on the relatively flat plain of Belgian Flanders, a 60 metre hill uh, is going to give you a great advantage in terms of your ability to watch what your enemy is doing. Oh, it, it, it's an extraordinary, <laughs> ridiculous as it may seem, it's an extraordinarily high hill, especially once you'd lost all the trees and the houses and everything, which the shelling will do, then the viewpoint from uh, Hill 60 is, is fantastic. The other thing I should stress is it's not a natural hill as well. It actually was a ridge, but it had been enhanced because there's a railway cutting going right along the side of it, and the spoil from the railway cutting uh, built in the 1850s, I think it was, uh, then they threw out the, uh, the spoil as they cut through the ridge uh, in, onto, uh, onto the, the, the hill itself and so formed a, a little bit of a higher hill than, than those around it. So Hill 60 is not totally natural. It's partly from this railway cutting. And from the time the fighting arrived here in the salient, the hill was a, a natural defensive position. It was a natural target for both sides just because of those advantages of observation. So when was the first fighting here at Hill 60? Yeah, well, it goes right the way to the beginning of the war as, as the the Germans arrived here um, in the uh, September. Then that's when the fighting will will start, and it's the French that actually hold it originally. The French uh, fight very hard to try and keep hold of it, but by the time they hand it over to the British troops, uh, then uh, they're actually no, no longer on it. And there is some debate about whether the French lost it or just slowly sl- slid down the the ridge because. As they handed it over, they actually said it was still under their control, but what became very obvious, it wasn't. Uh, it, had, it had been lost. Um, so it's right the way from the British appearing to, in the salient, holding on to the, those ridges, stopping the German advance right, right in 1914, and that's where it starts. The fighting continued throughout the war, and one of the key elements of the fighting here was mining. And we've, we've touched on mining at a few sites before when we've walked around the Somme and uh, Vimy Ridge. We talked about mining and basically what we... When we say mining, it's nothing to do with landmines. What we're talking about is tunnelers digging beneath the enemy lines and planting huge explosive charges and leaving these enormous craters. But this is probably the, one of the best sites on the Western Front to just understand how the landscape was torn apart by mining during the Great War. Uh, yeah, it's it, it truly is. It's, diff- it's one of those things that's difficult to envisage no matter how many times you visit the first world war and i have to say i'll just use a, an example i once took a film crew round that said pete can you take us to a wood that looks like a wood of the first world war well that's not possible because a wood of the first world war is no longer a wood it is blown to smithereens you know there's no ducking and diving through trees the trees have gone there's just stumps if you're lucky and then those may have been turned over as well so it, it's a landscape that's very hard to, to comprehend and then if you add in this underground mining not just the shelling and the the detonation of uh, of mines beneath uh, the troops, then it, it, it defies description, really. And, it, and it's quite something that's quite difficult to put across to people when even though you're looking at a landscape that is still rippling, as this landscape is, but it's still difficult to imagine it without any, any grass, without any vegetation, without any trees, because there are a lot of trees growing on the site now. And that's the key element of Hill 60 and why we visit it and why it's so important is because the landscape's been preserved. Let's talk a little bit about what happened immediately after the war and how we ended up with this wonderful site that that really tells a story by the nature of the the torn up landscape. Well, it's an interesting story. And I think it's a story that really could do with telling uh, properly. And I don't think I've ever seen a book or read an article about the, the total story of how it came about. It's now owned by the Commonwealth War Graves. So the Commonwealth War Graves, as it was the Imperial War Graves, look after it. But you have to think about how did that come about? And interestingly, it was actually purchased. So immediately after the war, a gentleman, I'm going to cover him in a second, a gentleman decided that he wanted to preserve a little bit of the landscape. Well, the first thing you have to think of, why did he pick Hill 60? Well, I think it's because Hill 60 
resonated with everybody. It was known by everybody. It was known by the families at home. It was known by the soldiers. And I think it because it, it filled people with such horror. If you were going into the sector that included Hill 60, you knew you were in for a rough time. So it was a, it was a location that was very, very well known um, uh, back in Britain and around the empire, you would have to say, Hill 60 was known by everybody. So I think that's partly the reason why it's going to be uh, purchased by this, this gentleman. But, but I think there's more to it than that. I think it's because... The landscape had been so devastated that you would have to say the farmer and the owner of the land prior to the war must have thought, how on earth am I going to get this back into any condition where I can use it for anything that's sensible? And so when Lieutenant Colonel uh, Corston uh, approached the landowners, uh, he was able to buy it for 15,000 Belgian francs which I don't know what the translation is. To me, it sounds quite a lot of money for a, a, not a great area of land that, that is completely devastated and was going to be very difficult to do anything with. But obviously he is buying it for another reason. He is buying it because he believes that this needs to be preserved. He had fought there and um, he had been actually wounded there. So it was a landscape that he was aware of. But then you have to ask yourself, why was he buying it? Why? Yes, he might think it has to be preserved, but that's a lot of money just to lose. I don't believe he was ever that wealthy. And in fact, will lose his his wealth later on. So um, why would you spend so much money? Yes, there's going to be an element of he will make money out of it. Now, it may only be that he will make money out of it to get his, his money back, the expenditure that he spent. But don't think that this site was just a site that was just open and you could just wander about. It was always going to be enclosed, which it was, and you paid your fee to go on there because there were people were looking after the site. They were making sure it didn't deteriorate. So it was a site where you paid your money. And oddly, for those that have listened to, to the podcast previously, you'll know that I'm a little bit of a collector and I have a, a ticket stub uh, for a franc or whatever it was. I can't remember off the top of my head, but whatever it was, then it's the stub that was given to you as you approached and went on to the site. Uh, and the site had various relics that had been left around. The trenches were fairly well preserved. There had been even oddities added to improve, I suppose, uh, the, the vision, the view across the battlefield or the old battlefields. So there was a scaffolding tower that you could climb up and go on top of that and take your photographs looking across the battlefield. And hundreds of thousands of people did, you would have to say, over the, the 10 years or more that it was open. It actually closed in, in the 1930. Um, but up until that point, then, then tens of thousands of people would have visited it on a little fragment of the battlefield that was going to remain a fragment of the battlefield. And so that's the key. And that's why we go today is because it is still a fragment of the battlefield where we can walk across it on the landscape that the soldiers walked on. And that's why it's so emotive to so many people is that you're walking on a landscape that really, yes, it's changed. Yes, yes, it's softened. Yes, the trees have grown and the grasses have grown. But you are still walking on a tiny fragment of the First World War battlefield. It's really quite beautiful as well. If you're there in spring, there's blossoms in the trees and flowers are out. It's, again, the great contradiction about the, the battlefields of the Great War is that it's actually beautiful countryside. It's, it's a lovely place to be. And yet you stand on Hill 60 in amongst the trenches and the pillboxes and the mine craters and just the... The, the, it's, you're not, you don't have to think very hard to, to realise the horror of what went on around there. And in fact, how many men are still buried I mean, I still lie beneath that hill. It's 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 really quite shocking to comprehend. Yeah, absolutely. That is one of the things I was just going to say myself, Matt, is, is they are still here as well. One of the reasons why the Commonwealth War Graves, uh, they were actually given this. It was given to, to, to Britain and then handed over by the British government to the Commonwealth War Graves almost immediately for them to do something with. Um, but it's, it's one of the things that, that becomes fairly obvious when you walk around the site is that if this site is still rippling and still as it was uh, trenched and created, then nobody has actually ploughed it or dug it or built anything on it. And of course, that is what uh, in other areas around the salient has brought the bodies to light throughout right to modern times. Um, and uh, so it's so if that hasn't happened, then the bodies that weren't recovered easily, that weren't easy to spot, then they are still there. And of course, beneath, really deep, you know, 30 metres uh, beneath the landscape, then we have that tunnel fighting that went on, and they're here as well. So you have, sadly, layers of bodies uh, uh, beneath you, or the potential of layers of bodies. Of course, there would have been a search of these areas. You know, people didn't just kind of abandon them. These areas were searched for bodies, but that's only really looking for human remains on the surface, or, or any signs that human remains may be below the surface. And as we know from the number of missing of the Great War, then it's it's not always particularly successful. 
So it's a, I'd say it's a rewarding and a confronting side at the same time. And this reiterates what we said at the start, that it's an essential site to visit. Well, you visit it a lot, Pete, so let's do a walk around the site and, um, and just share your experiences of walking Hill 60. Well, I think one of the interesting things is it's changed uh, from the early days when there were no duck boards. And we're going to enter the site onto a duck board tracking. At one time, it was just purely muddy trackways. And that was the problem. They were getting muddier and muddier. And as more and more people started visiting the site, and certainly since the, the film Beneath Hill 60, uh, which came out probably about eight or nine years ago now, um, uh, that also drew, drew more and more people and certainly drew an awful lot of Australians because it's about an Australian tunnelling company. And so we get more and more people coming and that, n- those numbers have increased uh, in the last 20 odd years. And so the, the walkways around the site, which you just you could wander wherever you wanted, were uh, difficult at, at various times of the year, especially if it had been raining a lot. So the Commonwealth War Graves decided that they needed to do something about it. And uh, it was in 2015 they started bringing in fairly heavy plants uh, and mechanical equipment to actually start putting in uh, a raised walkway that was going to zigzag all over the site. And for a change, and it's very unusual for the Commonwealth War Graves, they didn't get it right. And there was a big outcry from people who were saying, you cannot build, bring this mechanical equipment onto the site. There are the remains of soldiers beneath here. Um, and it's ruining the site, it's flattening some of the tr- the trenches and the uh, the shell holes. And so the work was stopped, and they changed the uh, tack completely and decided to reduce the number of uh, of walkways that were going to uh, go on- onto the site to just one that snakes from one side to the other, um, and also produce, do most of the work by hand. Uh, so it, it improved dramatically. I have to say, I, I wasn't always quite so happy about it. I thought it would change the site and make it feel uh, odd. But having now used this duck boarding that we're going to enter by in te- when the conditions are really bad, you realise it is very helpful and it gives you a little bit better view as well when you're walking across. So there, there's a lot to be gained by, uh, by the, the, uh, the duck boarding now. So we're going to enter the site by a new car park, also created at the same time. And the first thing that we're going to actually see is a memorial. So there are memorials within the site itself. And this is to the Queen Victoria's Rifles. And for those who haven't ever seen a photo of it, it is an odd-looking memorial. There are kind of bits sticking out here and bits sticking out there. It's squat. It's not attractive in any means. Uh, And it looks strange. And why it looks strange is because this is not the original memorial, because the fighting, very sadly, will return here in 1940, and this memorial is going to be damaged in the fighting of 1940 and not rebuilt as it had been. It had been a a rather large pinnacle, uh, an obelisk, Uh, with uh, a stairway going up from the old entrance, the stairway walking up to it, so with uh, organised flower beds and planting, so it was a bit more formal than than it is now, the whole site. And you have to ask, why why didn't they rebuild it at the end of the Second World War? Why did not they rebuild it as it had been? And I don't know exactly, but I I think I can guess, and it's because it was felt not the right thing to do. It was felt that the fighting had come back here yet again. It was such a horrific thought that the the area had been fought over again that it was decided just to rebuild it from the fragments that were left, put a new explanatory panel on it, and not make a big deal of it, really. And so we have this very subdued memorial now commemorating the Queen Victoria's Rifle. It's a London territorial, a part-time regiment uh, based in London, commemorating their service uh, and the fighting here. And in fact, as I said, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Corston, he was actually uh, with that battalion when they fought on the on Hill 60. So it's uh, it tells you something straight away that something went on here and we're going to be talking about that as we walk around the site during the Second World War as well. And that's almost too horrific to contemplate. A, a site that was so horrific in the First World War will be fought over again in the May of 1940 during the, uh, the fall back towards Dunkirk. So we're going to continue along that duck boarding, beautiful duck boarding, anti-slip, so you're not going to uh, to fall off it. It is a little odd for our modern minds, certainly those of, of us who are perhaps involved in uh, health and safety, because there's no handrail, it is slightly raised, so I always advise my clients uh, to try and not step off it, because it could be embarrassing. But eventually we are going to uh, walk off the duck boarding, because you need to get off it every now and then to actually put your feet on the ground. Pete, the thing that always strikes me when I visit Hill 60 is it's not just a preserved landscape with trenches and, and the occasional shell hole, as you see in other parts of the Western Front. It's, it, it demonstrates the, for, the ferocity and the technology that was employed during the fighting. 
because it's also covered in lumps of concrete, pill boxes. You can just see the you can just see the ferocity of the fighting that went on, the 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 systems that were employed to defend and to attack. It's really quite there's a there is a lot to see on Hill sixty, isn't there? It's a little bit unexpected. Well, I do. I'm going to do my famous concrete talk now. It is interesting in that just on the one site we can see how concrete uh, changes from frontline concrete to just behind the lines concrete. Because the first thing, as we step off the duck boarding, we're going to be uh, looking at a very low, almost disappearing in the ground. The, the soil has nearly covered it over, but it's a frontline gem and blockhouse. Now, I'm going to use lots of different terms. Pillbox, blockhouse, what is the difference? Well, there isn't. It's just words that we used at various times. My kind of attitude is I use blockhouse for something that's not got a firing aperture, and uh, I use pillbox for something that has got a firing aperture. But this one hasn't, so I think we'll stick to blockhouse. And it is literally a block of concrete that's hollow in the middle with a door at the back, and that's always the clue as to who built it, because the door is always facing your own lines. The door will never face your enemy. So the door here is facing back towards the German lines, not uh, looking out of the view across the, the salient and, and to Eep. Um, so it's German built. It's capable of taking two or three men at the most. And it is alongside another one that is, uh, has lost its roof, but is beside it. So you can see there were two or three all together here. And basically what they're for is they're for machine gunners. Machine gunners who will shelter in there. They're not going to fire. There's no firing aperture. When the time is right, they're going to come out with their machine gun, their Maxim gun, and they're going to set it up and open fire. So it's a shelter for uh, gunners, uh, frontline uh, machine gunners. The concrete is terrible. It's, uh, if you were involved in quality control of the mixing of concrete, then you would look at this and think, oh my goodness, this is just appalling. They've thrown in everything. But then you have to think about where it was. It's in the front line. It's right on the top of the crest. So it would be behind a pile of sandbags. And this is half a dozen Germans with buckets and spades and, and cement and basically throwing in anything that they can find to make a concrete and then pouring it in a framework. So there is a form in there. In other words, it's formed and it has steel inside, but the mixing of the concrete. So this is uh, concrete mixing under duress. Uh, you, you would have to be ducking and diving in the dark quietly trying to pour this concrete to build this uh, this this position so it's not good concrete and it's well worth pointing out because on other sites around the great war and in fact on this site you can see some very well poured concrete but this is not it this is frontline concrete so it's interesting just from that one point of view but then you have a look at the door at the back and you realize that even if this wasn't so full of soil and dug out this is a tiny door well, it's a tiny door because the smaller the door, then the less chance of jagged steel getting inside there and pinging about and killing everybody. So you need to have a small door. It's a kneeler door. You'd have gone in on your knees, basically, dragging your gun with you. And then possibly a steel plate inside, a couple of sandbags, you'd put those inside. And while the heavy shelling was going on, you'd be in there. And then when you start thinking about it, it just it just makes your the hairs on the back of your neck stand out as to what it would have been like inside that position uh, during a bombardment just horrific I'm, I'm i always say when i lead a tour that i'm a bit of a pillbox nerd because they're just such tangible connections with the fighting that went on pillboxes basically you know concrete protective structures are only built because people needed protection so they were never built you know 100 kilometers behind the lines they were built either right in the front line where there was shelling taking place all the time or slightly in the rear area where there were still shells falling all around and where people needed protection. And they're impossible to move. There's still massive concrete pillboxes all over the Western Front. So every time you go there, you know that there was a lot of heavy fighting in that area and that a lot of people died in the vicinity of where you are. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. Um, and that will become obvious as we start walking along the track. So now we're off the duck boarding and we're going to be walking along the track. And again, it weathers out. There's no lawn on the, on the tracked area. And I can't help it. I'm an obsessive uh, battlefield field walker, so I always just keep my eyes on, on the floor as I'm walking normally with my clients. And a number of times I've just bent down and picked up a button or, 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 or something of interest that you can just find there. And that's the clue. If you can find buttons and fragments of, of equipment, then sadly the men are going to be uh, there as well. Uh, and I haven't ever found human remains there, but I know people who have. So it, it really brings it home to you, these little pieces of, of metal that you can that you can pick up, these little pieces of brass as you're walking around us as we're walking through the site now we have a lot of trees there are cherry trees there are all sorts of trees because this is a little bit of a nature site as well 
it's looked after now with a view that uh, animals uh, will uh, will live here and so we have a lot of trees that will help animals and the this enormous cherry tree on our left hand side now got a fence around it so you can't get underneath it and uh, the reason for that is that it's uh, it lost a few big branches in recent years and i think they don't want anybody else to be killed on on hill 60 so they keep you away from that one but the other trees are uh, you can walk up to them and touch them and it's just nice to get that feel of nature remembering that everything that's growing there even though this is a big old tree everything that's growing on the site is post the first world war there's nothing pre because everything was totally obliterated here so we're going to walk back over the back of the ridge so we've got an element of safety now if you're a frontline soldier you're still not in view of your enemy as you're um, w working your way to the front line and we're going to walk up to another very big German blockhouse. Now, this is nothing like the one we've just been talking about. This is a big one. This would take uh, a, at least a dozen people if you squished them in there, and they did at the time when they needed to. Um, and it's got firing apertures, which is, is, is fairly unusual to see a big concrete blockhouse with firing apertures. Um, it's fascinating. To, we'll talk about the apertures. But what I always find fascinating is this must be the most photographed blockhouse on the Western Front. And it has been since the 1920s because it was always preserved. It was always there. And people came here and had their photographs taken. Now, I've got a little photograph uh, uh, archive, a photographic archive. And within those photographs, I've got a picture of a group of uh, veterans in the 1920s, possibly 1930s, standing around here, trilby hats on, gabardine max, sandwich boxes in one hand. And you can see a bottle of brown, a bottle of beer sticking out the other pocket. And they're laughing and smiling and standing around this uh, this blockhouse. And I just think it's a wonderful photograph because it's really about guys that survived the war and were able to come back and actually talk about it, which would have helped them immeasurably. And they're just standing arm in arm. Some of them have their arms linked. And you can tell they're on an org organised pilgrimage back to the First World War. Pete, when I take people around the battlefields, I always, again, as being a pillbox nerd, I always point out the differences between British and German pillboxes and say this one's a, you know, you can tell the concrete tends to be darker on a German pillbox. And as you said, the direction it's facing is the best indicator of what it was. But I always play a bit of a trick on them when, when I come to this one because I say, okay, you've had enough time now to learn all about pillboxes. Is this one a German or a British pillbox? And there's a, you know, spirited argument between the people on the tour. And in the end, I say, I'm sorry I've tricked you. It's actually both because this pillbox was what they called turned around, wasn't it? Just tell us the fascinating story of the life of this pillbox and how it came to look as it does now. Well, it's always a term that, uh, yeah, we used. Uh, this one was uh, reversed or turned around. And I can see people kind of looking at me. And I said, no, I don't mean literally. They didn't move it around. You cannot move a, a pillbox around. What they did was basically they, they altered it. So in this case, what they did was they literally cut through firing apertures. So this is after it was captured uh, during the Battle of Messine. And it's in, in, in fact, it's going to be Australian engineers, which will work on quite a bit of the uh, the, the changes to this, uh, to this uh, pillbox. So they're going to cut through apertures. We have two firing apertures, thin slits. Those slits look rather wide at the moment and that's because the timber work that went around the entrances that would have taken the impact of, of bullets being fired at them ricochets well it's to stop ricochets from going within the pillbox so they look like quite wide apertures but with the timber work then they would have been originally a lot smaller than that you can see the thickness of the concrete and that is always absolutely shocking if you haven't realized how thick these uh, the concrete is in a pillbox three feet at least uh, thick so i'm using the old money again three foot uh, of concrete so just enormously uh, uh, solid construction so to cut these apertures had not been easy uh, to, to, to reverse this to make it uh, into our firing position so that we could stop the Germans if ever they come back and come back they will in the spring of uh, 1918 and sadly it was overrun again this pillbox was taken in uh, in 1918 it's very obviously damaged we can see the damage all around the apertures and so again, what most people think is that this was damage from the fighting uh, in 1918 when the Germans retook it. But in fact, it's not. It was refronted uh, during the Second World War when we uh, used it again. So it's refronted, so it was tidied up, it had been damaged, but by the, the time that the Germans are going to return here in 1940, this was quite a smart looking position again, and it's going to be used again. And the damage that we can see all around it is from the fighting that took place here in 1940. In fact, it's fascinating that when you look careful at it, there is actually a 3.7 centimetre anti-tank round embedded in the concrete. So you can see it. I saw it for years without realising what it was. Until one day I was looking at the damage all around it and realised that these were shots 
uh, from an anti-tank gun. It's an anti-tank gun, a German light anti-tank gun that was brought up to take out this pillbox to a very close. And once you can see the, the angle of these rounds that are hitting the concrete and, and actually either embedding themselves in the concrete or ricocheting off, you can see exactly where the gun must have been firing from. And A Company of the 2nd Battalion Royal Scots Fusiliers, they almost fought uh, themselves out of existence here giving them more time to evacuate uh, the BEF, the British Expeditionary Force, more time to evacuate to the beaches of Dunkirk. So there was fairly tough fighting upon Hill 60 at this time in the May of 1940, which I think is just extraordinary. So now let's go back to those smiling, happy faces of the veterans of the 1930s. Who would have had... I just can't imagine what it must have felt like to them to know, because we did know it was in the newspapers that the fighting had returned, that the fighting returned to all of their battlefields of the First World War. And I just find that totally depressing, of how they must have felt, thinking that they had fought the war to end all wars, and yet the fighting is going to return to, uh, and it's the same old enemy, to the battlefields that they had fought during the, during 1418. It's very well said, Pete, and I, I can't begin to imagine the horror of the, the British troops defending that pillbox in 1940 as the Germans rolled up an anti-tank gun and just started blasting away at the apertures. It's just... I mean, I know it's what the Germans went through in the First World War. It's, it's, it's a nature of warfare. But it, it, I think it's important that we stand there and see that damage and we, you can see the individual shots from that gun and it just paints a picture for you of what it must have been like. It, I remember when I was in... Um, not to go off on too much of a tangent, but when I was in Russia and, and, and Eastern Europe, and back in my backpacking days, I, I went to a small island off Estonia where there'd been a lot of fighting... Um, both when the Germans rolled through in 41 and then, of course, when they were kicked back by the Russians in 44. And there were a number of pillboxes where you could just see damage to the apertures on the front, but then a huge amount of small arms fire damage inside the pillbox. And it just demonstrated that once these pillboxes had been overrun, someone just shoved a submachine gun in the back of the door and just sprayed the inside. And just... The, I, I, I can never get my head around it. That's probably part of my connection with pillboxes. It's just the nature of that type of fighting. So claustrophobic, so horrific, just absolutely awful. It's why it's always important that we stop and inspect these pillboxes and just think about what went on around them. I think it's confronting. No matter how much talking you do when you're in an open landscape and you're just talking about a battle in an open landscape, when you've got this tangible evidence of, of physical fighting, then it is confronting because it makes you think a little bit more deeply about what it would have been like to be been facing something, however, whatever it is, uh, whatever, however horrific, to, to face it and then to actually touch that that tangible evidence of that battle, that's, that's something taking place. Yeah, amazing. It, it, it is. Uh, and that's why this is such a great sight is because there is so much to see and I should say that we're going to just talk about these two pillboxes we won't talk about anymore but there are others scattered all over you walk over some you see the fragments of others and you realize that the Germans had seriously fortified Hill 60 with an awful lot of concrete in the periods when they held it which I have to say for most of the war they are holding Hill 60. If we're talking claustrophobia and the horror of close confines fighting and 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 being cut off from the open ground there's probably only one thing that's worse than the pillbox fighting, and that is the mine fighting, the tunnelers, the the engineers planting explosives meters, you know, tens of meters beneath the enemy. Let's talk about mining. We've touched on it on other podcasts. This is probably the best spot to know about it, and there there, there is a very famous mine crater here, the Hill Sixty Mine Crater. It is, and that's where we're heading now. We're going to uh, the pillbox that we've just been discussing is on our right-hand side. We're going to follow the windy track through the trees. This is where it always gets a bit boggy. gives you that bit more of a re realistic feeling in the winter. Um, up onto the, the crest of the crater, and we're going to be looking down into the Hill 60 Mine Crater. Now, I have had people who are expecting it to be something else, something much more... I suppose, defined. This is not a defined uh, crater particularly because it's going to be fought over again. It's also the nature of the clay. It doesn't leave a defined uh, blast uh, radius that you can uh, see very clearly as you can on the Somme battlefield. We're not far away from one that is very visible on the Somme. Um, this one is one that's going to be fought over after this uh, destination. Shell holes all, all within it, soil pouring back into it so it's not a massively defined one it also has another issue there's about a third of it missing because that railway cutting that i mentioned earlier that 
causes the height to be the, the hill 60 aspect, then that was half filled in again because of this detonation and that's going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be cut through again. So all the spoil that fell into that uh, railway cutting doesn't form a lip. So we've got basically a third of it is missing, a third of the lip is missing of the crater. So it's not quite as spectacular as people imagine and yet to my mind it is because it is, it is left exactly as it was. So we're going to walk down to the, uh, the centre of the cr uh, crater and as I say, this is the famous mine crater. That film, Beneath Hill 60, if you haven't seen it, then I would uh, try and uh, find it because it's, it's a very good film in giving you a feel. Not always historically correct. It has that bit of those brave Australians led by those nasty English officers, which is something in Australian films you get quite often. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's a really good depiction of what it was like to be a tunneler during the, the, the First World War. So let's, uh, as, uh, as Matt suggested, we'll talk a little bit about the tunnelling because the tunnelling is so different in different areas uh, of the battlefield. So where I live on the Somme, it's chalk, it's dry, you can tunnel fairly easily but you can be heard because chalk resonates. Where we are now, it's clay, it's uh, difficult to remove, it's boggy, it's cold. Removing it is difficult because it comes off in kind of in, in sticky lumps, and so you have to have people who were used to digging clay in sticky lumps, and they tend to be known as clay kickers. And they were people that basically you uh, sit down on a, a cruciform uh, T-shape um, and it supports your back and then you can lift your feet up onto your spade, which has a cross piece on it, push into the clay, twist and you pull out a plug of clay. You hand it to the chap behind you who puts it in a sandbag until he's got enough in that sandbag and then he passes it back and you've got a chain that will remove it, uh, remove it off the face of where you're digging. So what are the issues? Well, the issues are it's damp, it's uh, it's moves clay moves so you basically have to revet the whole thing in other words you have to put a basically box it in as you're tunneling you are boxing in the exact opposite of the uh, the the tunneling on the somme with it being chalk you didn't have to box it in at all it's self-supporting you can just carry on digging here every single meter has to be boxed in with timber so amounts of timber being used enormous it's totally silent so the Germans who were tunnelling as well, they could almost slide past each other uh, without knowing that they were there. And it gets so close that it's only when the walls start to wobble that you know there's something on the other side of it. And that's ridiculous when you think that it's on the Somme, it, the sounds travelling through the chalk travels faster than it travels through air. So so you could hear somebody almost the, immediately they started tunnelling, whereas uh, here on the salient in this clear you you couldn't. There's also other issues, and that's you've got layers of sand here, and sand obviously moves and is very difficult to tunnel through. Different types of clay, blue clay, which is a little a little uh, lower. So the guys that are doing this tunneling, they're not just Joe Bloggs being sent down. You know, give him a spade, you can do uh, you can do some tunneling today. These are mining engineers from all over the empire, and that means South Africa, Canada, Australia, Britain, tin miners, coal miners, gold miners every type of miners you can think of and they are going to be employed doing their job that they were doing but obviously under very trying and difficult circumstances. Let's talk about the Battle of Messines a little bit Pete where these tunnels were dug because the the story of the mines I mean we'll do we'll do separate walks around the Messines battlefield but the, the story of the mines here is is particularly relevant um, and just just give us an indication of how deep these mines were how much the explosives were let's talk a few facts and figures to, to describe how effectively half the hill has been blown away by this massive mine crater Okay, so so this wasn't just one mine. That's the first thing to say. What we're looking at now, or standing in the crater of, is the the last mine of nineteen mines during the Battle of Messines. Now, the Battle of Messines, seventh to the tenth of June for Australians, it's. One of the most successful actions of the Great War, you have to say. 19 mines blowing success successfully. Two did not go, but 19 of them did. This is the last one. Uh, and they blew, um, they were supposed to all blow at exactly the same time. Uh, and that uh, was 3.10 on the 7th of June. So 3.10 in the morning. And... It was a shock to the Germans. The Germans had no idea that this mine was going to, uh, to to go off because we dug the tunnels almost a year before. In fact, the Australians had not dug this tunnel. This is the Hill 60 mine. It had actually been done by the, the Canadians who had created the void, packed in the explosives. So how much explosives are we using here? Well, it's 53,300 pounds of aminol that's going to be packed in here. Well, you start thinking, 
What is that like? How, what does that look like? Well, it's an enormous, damn great room full of explosives. So you've got to dig out this large area, make sure that the explosives are protected from water. Because remember, this is waterlogged. So that's the other thing I should have added. If you're digging here, then really you have to pump 24-7. So for well over a year, this has been pumped. So this is why those men always in these, even though it's, it was completed a year before, men have needed to keep on top of it all the time to make sure the, the clay is not moving, that the water is removed and that the powder and aminol that is down there is kept dry, ready for when it's going to be needed. And, and this is going to be the, uh, the Battle of Messine. So all of these 19 mines, uh, roughly the same size, they're not, they're not all the same size, but roughly the same size, uh, are going to be detonated uh, in the morning on the 7th of June at 3.10. And there is a rippling effect that will take place because everybody was twitchy. You can imagine everybody's nervous about making sure they get it right. Synchronisation of watches, not brilliant. And so it's going to start on the right, looking at it from a, a British perspective, near Plug Street Wood. And uh, as I say, we'll, we will uh, uh, almost certainly do a podcast about the fighting around that area later on. And then the 19 mines coming like giant footsteps, I often describe it, towards this final one. And I think that's one of the more horrific aspects, really. If you were a German here and you knew what was coming, because you would have done, you could hear these giant's footsteps as each mine went off. And that's because everybody's a little nervous. What they're doing is they're waiting for the mine to blow on their right. And so you get this footstep uh, effect, uh, which must have been truly terrifying uh, for the guys that were in this last one, the German soldiers carrying in those concrete bunkers, thinking, is this underneath me? Uh, am I going to get caught by this blast? And and off it went. Um the spoil was blown out, and as I mentioned earlier, some of it was blown back in later on. Uh, but it, it's, it's left this enormous hole. So let's do the dimensions uh, uh, of the hole. So it's 60 feet or 80 metres, depending on which you want to use, deep. And it's 260 feet or 79 metres uh, wide. So it is it's a fairly big old hole in the ground. And if you add it together, all of the 19 detonations um, and tot it up, at that time, it is the largest man-made, if you put them together, largest man-made explosion that had taken place. Interestingly, it's not going to last very long because not long after this, uh, in Halifax, in Nova Scotia, an American ammunition ship blew up in the harbour there and that will become the biggest bomb until we get the, uh, uh, the atomic blasts of the Second World War. That will be the biggest explosion. It flattened Halifax in Nova Scotia. Uh, but up until that point, this was one of the, uh, the, the largest detonations. Now, there's all sorts of stories about how loud and, uh, and uh, how enormous were these 19 detonations. And one of the most famous stories that people tell, including myself for years, was that it rattled the windows in the Houses of Parliament and the teacups in the Houses of Parliament, and it was minuted in their, in their minute book. Well, interestingly you would have felt it in Britain and certainly at the coast when these uh, these mines went off. But it's not the mines particularly, it is the the artillery that opened up at the same time. It's one of the heaviest bombardments and a hurricane bombardment that took place at the same time as these detonations. And the combination of all of that is what it would have been uh, felt rather than heard. You would have heard it, but it's that feeling that you get in the stomach of, Imagine when you can hear a thunderstorm a long way away. You can feel it sometimes long before you can actually hear it. Well, that's the kind of effect that it, that it had in Britain. So it is an enormous blast and uh, was a, a very, very successful attack. Very well described, Pete. I mean, just, again, horrific elements. That's why we visit Hill 60, to bring these elements to life. But they're confronting. They're, they're confronting. And standing in the Hill 60 crater, you can walk to the bottom of it, which is um, always good to, to get a perspective from the bottom. Uh, just a just a, a fascinating and distressing aspect of fighting in the First World War, but uh, we're going to keep walking through the, uh, the the crater now, Pete. And what are we going to head to next? Well, we're climbing up the, the the lip of the crater and back towards the duck boarding, and that's one of the thankfully one of the things that I was concerned about when they put the duck boarding in. There was talk at one time that you would be held onto the duck boarding, that you would only be allowed to now no longer roam across the site. And thankfully that didn't uh, come to pass because, as I said earlier, one of the great aspects of this site is that we can go wherever we want. So very often I have to kind of gather the clients. I give them a little bit of time to wander about the crater and uh, into the site and have a look around. And we will gather ourselves again as we climb back onto the, the duck boarding. And we're going to walk down towards the road. Again, the road sweeps around one side of the, of the site. 
This is where the car parking used to be. But as we walk along the duck boarding, I always like to point this out because it, it irritates me a little bit, but only because it's not explained properly. And there is a steel uh, panel within the, the floorboards, the duck boarding, which says German front line and the date, and it's 1914. And then just up uh, less than 20 paces away, you can see another steel plate a little bit higher up, and it says British uh, or French front line uh, in that winter of 1914-15. Uh, and of course, when you see that the, the students of uh, school students, especially, they normally split into two halves and one half uh, stands on one panel and one half stands on the other panel. And they're shouting at each other and saying, look how close it is. The trenches were always this close, blah, blah, blah. And of course, what this is actually showing, it's showing the unusual. The unusual that just for a very short period in that winter of 16, 17, the trenches were very close together at this point. Would that be tenable? No, it wouldn't. Um, nobody would be able to hold those frontline positions easily. And in fact, in most cases, there was nobody in them, even though it's absolutely right. That is a frontline trench for the Germans. That is a frontline trench for the British or the French. And they are very close together. But all you need to do is to pick up a, a, a lump of, of rock. Now, I've seen a very good teacher hand out potatoes to his students and get them to throw potatoes at each other from one side to the other. And because what becomes apparent is if you had hand grenades, it is totally untenable. Now, in 1914, rudimentary hand grenades for ourselves, jammed in bombs, but the Germans had, uh, had, had well-made hand grenades. So it's not tenable. And it becomes very obvious it's not tenable. But unless there's a sign that says that, then then you can get the wrong idea by looking at sites like this where the trenches are very close together. So I always make sure that uh, my clients are aware that this is really pointing out the unusual. So we carry on up on the duck boarding. We're walking behind the Australian uh, commemoration of the tunnelers, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And we're going to walk towards a memorial to the 14th Light Division. So that's a British division, division about 20,000 men. And I always spend quite a bit of time here because it's a great memorial. It survived the uh, Second World War without being uh, damaged to a, a greater extent. I think it's a bit patched up a little bit, but it's uh, still complete. Um, and on it, it lists all of the units within that division, including the fighting forces and all the support forces. Now, I'm not going to go through everything here, but it's a great ready reckoner for those people that have often wondered, what does a division, what is the makeup of a division? 20,000 men, what are they all doing? So you can actually run through this and say, these guys are the infantry, these are the support arms on the other side, including the engineers and the medics, and on we go. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting memorial to actually have a look at and to discuss the makeup of a, of a division. We'll perhaps save that for a, uh, another podcast. Um, and then we're going to walk towards the road, but just before we actually uh, hit the road, on our left-hand side, oddly, we can see a French flag flying. And that catches out lots and lots of people. They see this French flag and they wonder, what is that all about? So as we walk towards the road, and usually on the left-hand side, we can see a French flag flying. So what have we got a French flag here, remembering that we're in, in Belgium? Well, this flag uh, is there along with a, a small memorial commemorating, again, the Second World War. And very sadly, it's where two resistance fighters, uh, a chap called Pierre Merchant and Lucien uh, Olivier, were murdered on the 2nd of September 1944. They'd been resistance fighters, captured in Lille with a lorry load of explosives. Not a good thing to be caught with, I suspect. And they were being uh, transported on the train, uh, presumably to be interrogated somewhere. We don't know exactly why. There are stories that they tried to escape. There are stories that the Germans have stopped the train and shot them. But uh, whatever happened, the local people had shots in the night. And in the morning, they found the bodies of these two young men uh, beside the railway track. Uh, they buried them close by. And, uh, and then uh, their relatives after the Second World War came and uh, removed them and took them home. So uh, I think it's a, a really nice gesture of the, of the Belgian uh, local people, they decided that they wanted to have uh, their, their deaths commemorated at this site. And so we have little uh, little pictures of them, little uh, uh, photographs embedded into a, a memorial. So I always take people across to go and uh, have, a, have a look at that site. And we're going to walk that way. Um, we'll come back to the Australia Memorial. We're going to walk that way. And just very briefly, I don't spend too long here because we've already covered mine craters but the Australian uh, tunnelling companies here that detonated those mines during the Battle of Messines wasn't just one, there was a second one. It's known as the Caterpillar. Uh, the Caterpillar is very different uh, to the one we've just been talking about, the Hill 60 mine, because the Hill 60 mine is created and, and looks as it did 
uh, or as it would have done uh, towards the end of the war. Uh, the Caterpillar looks very different. I don't know what you think about the Caterpillar, Matt. Well, it's a fascinating one because it's it's a perfectly symmetrical crater, like incredibly symmetrical and full of water. And again, being a, a, a you know a little bit silly, trying to lighten the mood a little bit with my groups, often I'll go up there and as we stand looking over it, I don't tell people where we're going. I just lead them through the woods to uh, to uh, the, to this crater. And when we get there, it's incredibly impressive. And I'll say something silly like, this was the Germans behind the lines built there, built a swimming pool so that they could have some rest and relaxation. And most people don't believe me, but you get the occasional person who goes, oh, really, that's fascinating. I never would have known. But my point is you can get away with this because it looks so man-made. It's so symmetrical. It's full of water. It looks like a pond in a in an English country park. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. And as you say, very, very different to the one only a few hundred metres away across the railway track at Hill 60. It is. I sometimes don't go to the Caterpillar for that very reason. It always feels slightly false to me. And, and more so in recent years because the trees used to come right to the lip of the, cater, uh, the Caterpillar. So you, you were sort of kind of on the edge of a wood looking down. They've now cleared all the trees from the from the lip. So there's, there are no trees around it. So it's now kind of open and looks even more formed as if it's been formed uh, deliberately. Um, and it obviously was. What happened at the end of the war, the, the Caterpillar crater was landscaped. It's, it's now part of a, a little parkland in this area. And um, um, and uh, yeah, there's. It feels odd. That's the only thing I'll say, really. But it's worthwhile going to have a look at because for a lot of people, that's what they're expecting. They're expecting to see this big crater um, with with water at the bottom, uh, and and they, you get that with that. But it doesn't to me. It's not part of the battlefield, which certainly Hill Sixty is. It's it's that preserved landscape. So we're going to turn around and we we'll walk back across the railway bridge. I'm not sure I mentioned that we crossed the railway bridge, and that's that uh, that railway that runs uh, uh, beside uh, Hill Sixty. Um, and walking to the Australian Memorial. And this is the Australian First Australian Tunnelling Company Memorial. For many years, this was really the one of only a couple of memorials commemorating tunnellers on the Western Front. So it was always very well visited by people who knew anything about tunnelling on the Western Front. Now, we've already talked about it a little bit. But for many, many years, it was not really part of the Great War that people really talked about. There were very few books that you could buy to learn about what it was like to be a tunneller in, in the Great War. It was almost an overlooked fragment of the, of the battlefield. And yet so many men involved, what I should have said earlier is that even infantrymen, just a straightforward infantryman in any kind of battalion, would take his turn at being in the tunnels because somebody, that chain of men that had to uh, pass the, the sandbags full of the spoil from the, the face of the tunnel, they took turns at going down into the tunnels to, to move spoil. And I often think that that must have been, you know, take your pick, don't you, which you prefer. Do you prefer to be in a trench where you're in the open and potentially you couldn't be killed by a shell fire or the snipers or whatever? or in a tunnel where you could potentially be killed by counter-tunnelling work when they blow something called a camoufle, which is an underground detonation designed to destroy tunnels and to kill tunnellers. So, and especially what if you're a bit claustrophobic? I'm not particularly, but I know lots of people are. And they suddenly said, right, guys, today we're going down the, the, the shaft, and these shafts are th small. These are small shafts. Does it give you an idea? If you put your hands together in front of you and point your elbows outwards, uh, then that is about how wide they are an awful lot of them and you then have to squat slightly so these are not uh, big tunnels i've been in quite a few over the years i've been involved uh, in helping out clear out tunnels at various sites uh, around the the western front and they are small the majority of these tunnels are very very small so, yeah, tu tunnelling was something that really needed a special kind of man. And the original tunnellers, as I s s uh, said earlier, they were recruited from uh, from companies and from for firms. And this is the case of the Australian, uh, first Australian tunnelling company. It was originally a, a boring company of, of men that were, uh, it was suggested that they, they might like to go to the Western Front and continue doing their, their job on the Western Front. Well, how do you entice somebody to uh, to come and onto the Western Front when this is volunteers? Australians are Australians; they're volunteers. Uh, nobody can force you to go. And of course, it's money, money, adventure, all the rest of those things that brought people to the uh, to the battlefields. But money helps. If you're going to be paid very well, then uh, then it helps immeasurably. It's a fascinating memorial, Pete, and it's got the rising sun on it, and Australians gather around and and, and really like to see it. But it's also bears the scars of the fighting here in the Second World War, doesn't it, as well? Just illustrating that fighting came back and that peace did not last very long. It's it's fascinating to stand there and see the, the chunks gouged out of it from fighting in the Second World War. 
It is, and uh, it's interesting. It, it's, it has an interesting history, does the memorial, because it's, it's got a brass panel on it, and that brass panel on the front with the rising sun and, and the wording uh, has damage from bullet fire uh, through the brass panelling. But if you look behind it, and you can see just behind the brass panelling, you realise that it didn't always have a brass panel on. So at some stage prior to the Second World War, this, w- this was added because originally the... Uh, the actual lettering was carved into the memorial itself. So it's it's gone through a period when it probably was looking a bit shabby and they decided to, to add the brass panel to it. So again, it's a great link. And people say, why haven't they cast another panel? Uh, you could easily, you could take off that brass panel and uh, within a, a few weeks you would have a brand new one looking spick and span. But of course, it's the history. It, it, it's, it's a memorial in its own right to those men that fought and died around this memorial during the Second World War. So it's, it's part of the history. And I love the fact that they've left that damage uh, upon the memorial. There's a couple of key sites on the Western Front where that's the case. And I'm talking from an Australian perspective here. I know there's many from the British perspective as well, but... In particular, the Australian National Memorial at Villers Bretno in France has a lot of damage on it from the Second World War, which, as they explain on a plaque on the side, they decided to leave as, as, a, as a testament to the, the men who fought there in the Second World War. Um, also at Pozier at the Tank Memorial across from the Australian Memorial at the, at the windmill site, there is the memorial to tanks used for the first time in battle in 1916, and a couple of the tanks have um, bullet damage on them. There's still a bullet <laughs> wedged in one of the tanks. We'll talk about that when we do our Posse Air Walk, but um, it's, it's, I think I agree with you entirely. The, the, the fact, the First and Second World Wars are really separate chapters of the same story, and the fact that the Germans were back here only 20 years after the First World War ended uh, is a story that should be told, and, and I think that by leaving these damaged sites, they tell that story better than any plaque or any card in a museum possibly could. I think it's a story that perhaps we'll tell uh, in another podcast, uh, the story of the fighting around Hill 60 and the fighting uh, to take Ypres when the Germans uh, uh, took Ypres in 1940. It's, uh, it's another story that, that, that we should tell. Well, we're really nearing the end of the walk now, Pete. Is there anything in additional you want to add to about, about Hill 60? Well, there's just a comical story and it's well, uh, well worth repeating because everybody points it out. Um, and as we're just about to leave on the right hand side, we can see a, a, a ball, a steel ball in the bottom of one of the craters. And I always have a, a little bet uh, with myself as to who is going to ask me, because I know somebody will. Somebody will say, Pete, what is that down there? And I always try and judge my clients and, uh, and figure out which one uh, is going to ask. And then we have a little guessing uh, competition of what it might be. And there's always somebody there that will get it because somebody will know a broader aspect of history because, oddly, it's a sea mine. And so I generally make the joke at this point and saying, uh, do you think the tide comes up this far? And the answer, obviously, is not. So what is a sea mine doing at the bottom of one of the craters on Hill 60? And it's because uh, there used to be a museum up until the uh, the 80s, I think. There was a museum called the Hill 60 Museum. That is, We're going to walk past it as we head back to our transport. And uh, that little museum, when it closed, all of the artefacts were sold to various other, uh, other museums and, and private people. But nobody wanted a rusty old sea mine. So it was just rolled over the edge and, and rolled into the Hill 60 site and there it remained, slowly rotting away. At one time, it was in such a good condition that you could move it about and every time I turned up, it had been moved to a different shell hole and, and pushed around. Uh, sadly, now it's it's collapsed and it just sits in the, in the one lo- location. So it's uh, always well worth having a, uh, having a quick look at and having a chat about First World War uh, sea mine. That was always a uh, a bit of a guessing game as to where the uh, where the mine would be on Hill Sixty. Sometimes it was in a crater near the front entrance. Sometimes it was in the main one. <laughs> I don't know whether it was teenagers yeah. coming out just rolling it around for a bit of fun, but it, I think it so. roamed yeah. it roamed all over Hill Sixty uh, in in previous years. Well, Pete, it's been fascinating, like always. It's been really great. It, it, it's really I've got to say to whoever listening to this, it's really interesting from my point of view because I think I know these sites well. I I get paid to lead tours. I you know people like what I've got to say when I walk this ground. Yet, when I do these podcasts with you, Pete, my breadth of knowledge is minuscule compared to what you know. So I, I love doing this. And this is why you're our most popular guide on the Western Front, Pete. It's because you just know this stuff so well. And so I, I hope everyone listening is getting a real thrill out of this because I certainly am as well. I'm just really loving this. And one day soon, mate, we'll be able to uh, roam the battlefields together again, hopefully leading a tour of, 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 of hardy individuals who want to come with us. Uh, I just can't wait to get back over there and walk these sites for real. No, uh, yeah, I'm with you there. I just can't wait to get back to some of these sites that we're, we're talking about. Yeah. 
Well, Pete, we've got some exciting episodes of Battle Walks coming up. Thank you very much for listening in. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, please, like always, leave some feedback for us on Facebook or on Twitter, um, especially on Apple Podcasts. If you can click the uh, the five stars, if you uh, would be so kind and give us a nice review there, that helps more people find the podcast. Pete, thank you for your empathy, for your compassion, for your immense knowledge. It's just it's wonderful to have you walking these sites in a virtual form and, and hopefully not too far away from walking them for real. But just thank you so much for, uh, for joining us on Battlewalks. Pleasure, Matt. Looking forward to the next one. Mm-hmm.